Hi, I'm Tom McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me, our co-host, Diane McGarry, pianist Carmen Rodriguez Peralta, flautist Orlando Sella, and ASL interpreter Connie. Carmen is a pianist and the music department chair at Middlesex Community College, Bedford and Lowell, Massachusetts, and director of a World of Music concert series. She has performed as piano soloist and chamber musician throughout the United States, Peru, and Mexico, including two solo recitals at Carnegie Recital Hall. She has given numerous lecture recitals on Latin American music at various universities throughout the United States. She is also dedicated to performing new American music and has given many premieres of works by New England composers. Her recordings include Teresa Carreño, solo piano and chamber works, music for cello and piano from Latin America, and her most recent albums, A Peruvian Sojourn, recorded with Orlando, and Larry Bell, Preludes and Fugues, both released by Albany Records in 2022. Carmen holds a postgraduate diploma from the Juilliard School. Orlando is a flautist, conductor, and music professor at Middlesex Community College. He is also on the faculty of Berklee College of Music. He has premiered over 200 works, both as a conductor and a flautist, performing throughout the United States, Europe, and China. He recently became a finalist in the American Prize in the Professional Instrumentalist Division. He released his third solo CD, Shadow Etchings. As a conductor, he is music director of the Lowell Chamber Orchestra and the Arlington Philharmonic Orchestra. Orlando holds two Master of Music degrees, flute performance and conducting from the New England Conservatory of Music. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your concert will include Middlesex Community College faculty member and guitarist, Relay Bags, as well as Middlesex Community, Middlesex Community College graduate and cellist, Nathaniel Abreu. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Cool. That's, that's so exciting. So, how did you begin collaborating together? Uh, well, we met about, what, 15 years ago, Orlando? Is that right, do you think? Yes, maybe a little bit more than that. Over 15 years now. Right. Mm -hmm. So, a long time ago. So, we've been playing together for quite a while. And then after that, he was hired at Middlesex until we had the opportunity to play together even more. That's great. That's great. Is that where the idea for this world concert series came from, your collaborations? No, I, that started back in 2001. So we've been running that series for, for many, cool. many years. Cool. Uh, but Orlando has performed many times in that series. But um, it's been, we have about 12 concerts a year. And we've started wow. this thing quite a while ago. So can you tell us even more about this World of Music concert series, please? Sure. So it started out in Bedford, I think, hmm. 2001, because that was our main campus and the only campus that had a concert hall. Ah. All right. And then when we have a Lowell campus, we got very good facilities there. So now we have it on both campuses. We have concerts in both campuses. Nice. And it includes faculty members, guest artists, um, students, uh, mostly classical, but also we have jazz, we have world music. So it really is a world music, a variety of music from people in the community and people from the outside as well. It's now we're very happy we include in our series uh, Orlando's new group, the Little Chamber Orchestra, so that oh. they're kind of in residence at Middlesex. And so oh. they frequently do concerts as part of the series. So we're very excited about that as well. That's nice. Oh. What regions of the world uh, have you included, you know, the, the music of those regions? What, what kinds have you included, just for a few examples? Oh, my goodness. So standard classical repertoire from Europe, a um, healthy dose of Latin American music, of course, yeah. quite a bit of American music. We've had, um, we had at one point four composers on our faculty, and so we would commission them to write pieces. We also have visiting composers, especially the Lowell Chamber Orchestra. It's a great job of that, of having living composers um, from underrepresented ethnicities that come and talk about their music, and then the orchestra performs their pieces. Uh, we have an upcoming lecture recital on music from South Africa. So we really try to include a lot. And also, I should mention, we have a big Cambodian community. in. Yeah. And so we do include Cambodian folk music and also the classical Cambodian music that 
classical traditions that combines we try to, to cover wow. just about everything. Wow, that is cool. Uh, and clearly you both enjoy, uh, I guess, performing and leading the, these efforts. Yes, certainly do. Do you but, have a particular favorite uh, out of all these genres and uh, world music? Do you have a personal favorite, either of you? Whatever I'm working <laughs> on at the time. <laughs> How about you, Orlando? I have to say, yeah, one one tends to live in the moment when you are working on a program. So that is like your your favorite piece yeah. that that month or week or two weeks or, <laughs> or day yeah. or day, depending. Yes, spoken like a true musician. <laughs> She's the musician. I'm the engineer. So. <laughs> If you don't dive into the artistry of the piece, you can't really make it live and sing. Right, right. Correct. You have to become but, immersed in that that composer or that type of music. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the beauty. So how did you come to music? Obviously, you both love music. How did you come to this field? Uh, I guess I'll start. I started piano lessons at seven. And for me, for many years, it was just an avocation, something I enjoyed doing in addition to other things. And I guess when I was a senior in high school, so kind of late, I decided to maybe I would major in music. And then from then on, it's been obviously my primary concentration. Yeah, I, I started music when I was, you know, playing the recorder in class and I, I really got adept to that. So then I found that there was a transverse flute, the orchestral flute pretty much. Oh. And then from there on, uh, you know, I just, practiced more and more and more until you know i knew that that's what i wanted to do cool that's great that's great yeah so many people who are professional musicians in all their life started as youngsters it's a right. really important aspect that we're losing a little bit in our public schools these days because the music programs are being cut which breaks my heart actually mm -hmm. but it's so important to have the opportunity to to start young and to be exposed to music and the arts. Absolutely. I second that. <laughs> so what is your favorite bit? Do you like conducting or playing more, Orlando? Uh, about the same. You know, um, the, the good thing about conducting is that you are helping a large amount of people do their best, huh. uh, like collaborate in a way that they can produce the best of themselves at a particular moment. That's what I really enjoy. Uh, you can also say that about playing, of course, it's just with a much smaller amount of people, right? It's, sure, so sure. it's it's, a, it's about the same, you know, as long as, as, long as the uh, collaborative aspect is there and everybody's giving their best, it doesn't matter if I'm playing or conducting, it's, it's always wonderful. That's interesting. I have a nephew who's a neurosurgeon and he recently gave a TED talk about the importance of being at your best in every moment and mm -hmm. expecting the best from all of your colleagues in every moment and that we don't always think of the importance of that but clearly in surgery and in performing a concerto or a duo you really need the best of each other so you can rely on each other in those moments Correct. And as a conductor, you really are not making any noise. You're not making anything that is tangible to the audience in an um, artistic way, really. What, what you do need to do is provide everything that the musicians need mm. to then create something as a, as a whole. So that is, is very, very, very important to be able to empower people to do their best oh, yeah. at every single second that they're performing that particular piece. Yeah. That also needs an intimate relationship, right? You need to know each other's strengths and weaknesses so that you can help support people where they're not as strong, perhaps. Or maybe that's not the right word. Yeah, no, correct. I mean, we all have strengths and weaknesses in, in every part of our life. And when it comes to, uh, to an orchestra, it doesn't matter the size, you will always have folks that are very adept at some parts of music than others. And the job of the conductor is exactly what you said, to make sure that you can balance those strengths and weaknesses so that you can get the best performance possible. How do you find that, Carmen, in, in your duty as a um, music chair? 
that must be a very important role about collaboration and and building unity and support for each other. Absolutely. And I'm very lucky that all my colleagues are wonderful. And of course. <laughs> and they're very wonderful to collaborate with. And one of the things that's really nice is that we collaborate not only academically, you know, deciding which courses to offer, the schedule, all that, but we play together. And so um, maybe I shouldn't announce this, but a lot of our faculty meetings consist of rehearsals, you know, so we're rehearsing and we get a lot of the academic part done, you know, during the rehearsal. And so it's very nice to see my colleagues in these different ways as professors, of course, dedicated to their students, but also playing with them, collaborating with them, talking about our opinions about this passage in music, for example. Yeah. So it's a very nice combination. That sounds very exciting, actually. It is, yeah. <laughs> So what other, um, the pieces you're working on now and a little bit about this concert's coming up, what is what are the exciting moments in it that you would like oh, to share? It's all exciting, right? <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really pick what you want. So what, I, what we tried to do in this concert was just present a lot of shorter pieces so we could present a variety of styles within an hour. Oh, nice. So we have traditional music from Europe. We have Johann Sebastian Bach, his son, Johann Christian Bach. But then we also have um, some unfamiliar composers. Uh, we have David Hewitt from South Africa. I was not familiar with this music at all. Um, this music from the US, Vincent Persichetti, uh, who is very important to me because he was my professor at Juilliard and I was his teaching assistant. So that was it's always fun to play his music. And then uh, music from Latin America, because it's always important to include music from Latin America, right, Orlando? Absolutely. I am always very happy because Carmen happens to curate very inclusive programs, programs that show not only the, the canon of classical music, but also composers from very many different places and, and, and races as well. And of course, uh, all genders as well. So it's very, very important to showcase the the history of classical music, oh, yeah. and actually the modern voices. And I always, I'm happy that Carmen can, you know, find pieces to really encompass a number of tastes and varieties and everything. You know, there's always something for everybody. Right. That was the, that was the idea. Basically. Yeah. It, it's interesting. You've both brought up a few times that. When people think of classical music, they it's very Eurocentric uh -huh. in our minds, but the classical forms have been used around the world. Of course, yeah. and it's and really how many composers from around the world who are classically trained can use those forms, but then fill them with all this content that's uniquely from their culture, their country. Yeah. Um, and so this is a common language. The form is a common language we're all familiar with. Rondo form, even if we don't know the word for, we're all familiar with the idea. And so you have that form, but then it sounds very different because you have someone's different perspective from a different culture. Yeah. That's what makes it so exciting. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And yeah. I should return the compliment and say uh, the Lowell Chamber Orchestra concerts also have great diversity and great variety and so there'll be some standard orchestral pieces there that you've heard before and are enjoying hearing again and something brand new by a living composer who was there in the audience and talks about the piece wow. beforehand so that's really important i think uh for our community and for our students to realize that classical music is living it's not just something wonderful from 300 years ago but it's still going on to traditions are still present and new things are being added to it yeah and that it still speaks to us right yeah. in the present not just that Bach speaks to us because there are certain composers Bach and Mozart and um, Rachmaninoff they will speak through to us through the through time but there are there are people composing in this moment that speak to us right in this moment in ways that those from the past can't because they didn't have similar experiences. So there is shared humanity for all of us, right? We all have had. Right. Right. Exactly, yeah. Uh, earlier, you mentioned classical stuff. So I immediately thought I, I know a very tiny amount about Indian music. But the one interesting fact I know is that the violin 
has been a classical Indian instrument for 500 years, <laughs> but it's played sitting down. Right. So, of course, uh, the point there is that, of course, everybody else has their classical tradition, but they also influence each other. That's true in Cambodian music, too. They call it Cambodian classical music. It doesn't isn't like European classical music, obviously, but it's their, their tradition, their instruments. Yeah, at Middlesex, I teach world music, and everything I'm teaching is classical music, but it's Indian classical music, oh. and then Arabic classical music, and then Chinese classical music. Every culture has their classical music, right? Oh. Yeah. It's just that we have labeled not classical music in such a Eurocentric way to talk about, you know, the the culture that we have grown with, you know, and sometimes we don't seem to include that into other other countries. So it's important to keep again the the door open to get you know Western classical music to the classical music from other countries. Yeah. That's and so how they influence each other. You know how mm -hmm. Indian and Cambodian and uh, other types of classical music from regional classical music can influence the general classical music. But I agree, the classical music term is not a very good one. No, so, it is. <laughs> music appreciation, classical for them means Bach or Beethoven, you know. So one of the first classes, I mean, Orlando does the same thing. You know, I'll present them with some really way out dissonant new piece. And I'll say, this is classical music. Like, what? <laughs> But this is classical music. This is not what you think of when you. So the idea of being, if they learn nothing else in the class, at least they know that classical music is a label for a huge variety of music. It's not oh, like yeah. one. Yeah, that's the problem with labels, isn't it? That we just I so. limit ourselves yeah. and we limit others sometimes. It's great that you're breaking that open. We try, we try. <laughs> it's very important. So you do 12 concerts a year, you said. So how do you, um, what's your idea of a theme for the year? Or do you have an idea of how the year is going to unfold? So we don't really have a theme. I mean, this, for example, in the fall, we have two Lowell Chamber Orchestra concerts. They're very different programs. We have, uh, we're happily collaborating with you in the Drake at Arts. So it's the first time we have an online concert as part of the regular concert series. Then we have a concert as part of the 2023, it's the Lowell Learns Festival. Oh, and wow. so we're doing a literature through music concert, which would be oh. really accomplished, really interesting. And student recitals, and um, we have a klezmer group coming. Oh, neat. Oh. neat. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so there... we're kind of coming out of the pandemic, though we still have to be careful. Uh, were, were you affect how were you affected by the pandemic i'm sure it affects everybody in different ways but can you say a little bit about that if you feel like it please sure, i'll let orlando start while i drink the water sure yeah. so you know one of the the main beauties of classical music or you know, performing is to perform for other people yeah. so <laughs> i mean it's it's always nice to get together and to play for each other right that's nice yeah. But it's really, really the ultimate goal to play and share with others. And the pandemic did limit that a lot mm. for all arts, you know. And I mean, you can say that for every single walk of life, we were limited of sharing. And that was a big thing. So thank goodness we have the technology now that we were able to share uh, virtually through YouTube and videos and recordings. Um, so we, we did that a lot, but coming out of the of the pandemic, I have a brand new appreciation for you know warm bodies in the audience that go uh, from their home to a concert hall and they take a, a piece of paper with the program printed in it and then they say thank you afterwards. They say hello beforehand. I mean the little things that that has been coming out of the pandemic like. The biggest reward, the human touch of our audience. But I think it also did provide a, an additional way to reach the audience online, which I think was really important. And so, for example, we do a concert in person. We'll post either the entire concert or selections. And people will go back and listen to it much more now than they did before. 
like, oh, I really like that piece. Let me listen to that again. Yeah. So they they come in person, but then they're able to listen to the same performance, you know, uh, that's been filmed, which I think is important. Yeah. And that's then you great. can reach more people. You can reach people both in person and also, you know, online. So I think it's been an advantage in that sense, although as Orlando said, it was really tough. I remember that concert we gave together, Orlando, where we had to space ourselves and you were like the one end of the of the stage and you had plexiglass wow. in front of you. And, and I, was, I like, was behind a plexiglass shield. It's oh, true. wow. <laughs> and then I had a mask and there was a chalice far away and we somehow had to see each other play together. You know, it was really very bizarre. Huh. It must have been extremely challenging. It, and there was a live performance, live performance for the cameraman. So we we filmed it as if it were a live performance, but there was no audience. It's so oh. hard to get out there and play on a stage space like that. Oh. And there's really no one there. It's just this cameraman is there. And we have to pretend, oh, yeah, there's this big audience. That's there listening to us. So we got used to it, but it was very, very strange initially. Both yeah. the distance and the lack of a public there. It's very interesting. So, you know, the Drake at Arts was at first in a facility. It was a two day festival. Actually, we had a um, a two day art show and then an author's reading and a performance were in the afternoon of the last day and the evening. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So everything has now gone online. And our audience is very diversified now because we can reach people all around the world. And we do. At the same time, the visual artist doesn't care. It didn't make any difference for them. The authors still have people who come live because we do the author's reading and Q&A live. And they're like, eh, it's no big deal. But the musicians, not being able to have that interaction with the audience, that's the hardest. It's the hardest for the musicians. And I totally get it myself as a musician because there's this intimacy that you get. You play back and forth with them. And it's... Um, it's difficult when we we record a lot of the artists in our home actually beforehand and Tom and I sit there and give them our undivided attention which is wonderful. <laughs> but we also know how important that is to have somebody to be playing off of and with really it really exactly. makes and you can feel the response of the audience even if you don't see them I mean if you're a singer you're facing the audience but as a pianist you know you're facing the music you're facing away but I can still sense the reaction you know, of the audience, the feel of the crowd. Sort of yeah, thing. yeah. Yeah, I'm a therapeutic musician now, so I feel it in a whole different way. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this has been great talking to you. Thank you so much for spending Thank you. Time. No, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> really good. Thank, it's been really fun, really enjoyable just to talk. So thank you for spending the time with us. Uh, we are really excited to be showcasing Middlesex Community College faculty and alums and your World of Music concert series at our November Arts Saturday. Tickets are available on Eventbrite, so search for Dracut Arts, D-R-A-C-U-T-A-R-T-S. We'd like to thank our many sponsors for making these programs possible. So Diana's put up the list, Amy Lamb, Shelley Payson, Robin Rubendunst, Susan Belkin, Helen Fremont, Caroline Scott, Philip Thibault, Lois Welber, Anita ba uh, Baglanaeus, Marianne Dernis Goldman, Galena Sokach, Anonymous, Diane's Song, and the Massachusetts Council, Cultural Council. So the, our program is supported in part by the Massachusetts Cultural Council Festival and Projects Grant and by grants from the Concord, Dracut, North Reading, Westford, and Wilmington Cultural Councils, local agencies which are supported by the Mass Cultural Council, which is a state agency. For more information about this and other programs or to become a sponsor, email us at dracutarts at gmail.com or visit our website, drakeitarts.com. And you can also find our programs on the Drake It Arts YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash at sign Drake It Arts. Thank you so much. <laughs>